Why are galaxies and star systems flat? What does the future of the space race look like? Are we going to Mars to mine it? And in Q&A Plus, what sparked my personal interest for space as a kid? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. King of Beasts, why are star systems and galaxies kind of flat? I mean, take the solar system, the sun and all the planets are moving in 2D with little use of the third dimension. So the shape of the solar system is a disk with the sun at the center and with all of the planets in varying concentric rings along the equator of the sun. And this is because this is how the solar system formed that in the beginning, there was a giant cloud of gas and dust, it spun up, it collapsed under its own gravity. And as it spun faster and faster, it flattened out. And so think about pizza, you take a pizza, you spin it, uh, pizza dough, it gets bigger, you know, it doesn't turn into a ball, it wants to flatten out. And this is the process that happened in the solar system. And this is the process that happened with galaxies. When you look at galaxies, they are also big flat disks. And so that tells you something about their form formation. Um, and there are, you know, over time ways that gravitational interactions, three body interactions can force objects out of that plane, uh, and out into things that go above and below the the solar equator, but it's very rare. And so mostly, or in all cases, you look out and we see solar systems. Recently, astronomers found uh, a planet orbiting around two brown dwarfs that is on a perpendicular orbit, but it's incredibly rare and requires very special orbital mechanics to once you get out of that initial formation to get something a little weirder. So no, there is there's nothing interesting above and below the the sun's equator plane, you know, the, the, the disk of the solar system, all of the good stuff is here, all the asteroids, all the Kuiper belt objects. Now there could be Oort cloud objects, they're probably in a sphere around the solar system, but but everything good is pretty much in this flat plane, which is very convenient, right? Like imagine if you had to go in all kinds of different dimensions to be able to go and look at stuff. But no, you can just go and do a flyby of Jupiter, then Saturn, then Uranus, then Neptune, all in one flight, which is pretty great. Indrek Stahl, how do you see the future of the space race, private companies, national rivalries or something else? In your view, what is the biggest obstacle to our next steps in space exploration and colonization? I think that the future of space exploration is just going to continue on that, you know, we're watching this technological curve up of our capability of the the ability to launch rockets more reusability bringing the launch cost down miniaturizing all of the capabilities. And that is just going to continue. And when you go back and look at the space race back in the 60s, that was two of the largest richest countries on Earth deciding to demonstrate who could get to the moon first, and they're willing to spend enormous amounts of, of money at the time, you know, it's estimated that the Apollo program cost about $350 billion in inflation adjusted money. And when you compare that to NASA's current budget of like $25 billion a year, it was a huge chunk of the US's uh, gross domestic product at the time. And the Russians, the Soviets were spending similar amounts, and both were going as hard as they could to be able to do this. And so if you take the a big chunk of your entire economy, and you set it on this one goal, then it creates this this aberration. And it's no surprise that after the Apollo era ended after the US had demonstrated that it could beat the Soviets to the moon, it stopped investing in sending people to the moon because nobody had the stomach to keep spending that money. But in the background, all of the technology was continuing to advance computers were starting to get better. Um, more and more aerospace firms were being developed. And you saw entirely new classifications of, of spacecraft, CubeSats, things that you can hold in the palm of your hand that will still do the work of a satellite. And then in the mid 2000s, we saw the rise of reusable rocketry with with SpaceX. And and that has continued this this ongoing progress. And when you look at the existing human space exploration plans coming out of China and coming out of, of the US and, and Europe and others, they're being done on a shoestring budget compared to what was done back in the 
in the 1960s and 1970s. NASA sets aside whatever, five to $10 billion a year to work on the Artemis program. That's nothing. That's nothing. SpaceX is developing Starship and this fully two stage reusable two stage rocket for a couple of billion dollars a year. Again, nothing compared to what was spent back in the day. And that you know, we've seen all around us what technology what research and innovation does to every part of our lives that the internet gets faster, our computers get faster, things get cheaper, things get more reliable and better. And so those forces have been working all along behind the scenes. And that when you have like, say, a Falcon 9 that is able to land autonomously on a barge floating in the ocean that's rocking back and forth, like you couldn't do that without a really powerful computer that's able to to compensate for all of the forces that are happening. So so what is the future? The future is all of the above. The future is, is that all of these forces that are moving us forward in terms of miniaturization, in terms of lowering costs, cheaper access, will help us start to build up infrastructure in space that, you know, right now, there is one international space station, and then the Chinese space station, and then there are other people who are building private space stations, that we will eventually see a constellation of space stations around the Earth. Just today, China launched uh, the next part of its relay system for telecommunications from into geosynchronous orbit. And so they're building up their infrastructure to be able to communicate to and from the moon. Uh, NASA is just completing work on various chunks of the lunar gateway that there will eventually be this station that's out between the Earth and the moon that the Chinese are planning to send humans to the moon, they're planning to build a a station, a permanent station on the moon. And so all of these things are just going to keep going forward. And if someone wants to spend more, sort of pull the timeline forward, then they can do that in the same way that happened with Apollo. Someone can go, you know what, it's time for us to go to Mars, we're going to spend 5% of the US economy on going to Mars, you would go to Mars right away, it would happen very quickly, or you wait that we're going to go to Mars when the infrastructure is in place, that someone can do this without breaking the bank, that will also happen, but then you push the timelines out. And so I think the 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 way to really look at what is the future of humanity in space is purely to look at the increasing gross domestic product of our planet, that humanity makes however many tens of trillions of dollars a year, $100 trillion a year, like a large amount of money. Um, and that number has been growing. And that is supported by the resources that we have on Earth, the sunlight that falls to the planet from space, we're limited by the amount of the carrying capacity of planet Earth. And yet that progress will continue on into the future. And there's really interesting papers that have been done where people have looked at like, what is the what is the future hold if you just continue our growth into the future, then after a while, we have to be exploiting cis lunar space, we have to be exploiting the asteroid belt. And it's not long, like it's 300 years from now 250 years like we are growth to support the gross domestic product at that continuing growing rate of like 2% per year. The only way that's possible is if we have essentially set up infrastructure across the entire solar system, and we are a true solar system spanning civilization. And so I don't know how it will happen in the same way that I don't know how a city like Manhattan was built, you know, if you had me plan out how would a city be built? I don't know, it's just gonna happen right, people are just going to show up and they'll do the thing, they'll tear down buildings, they'll make economic choices. And eventually a city will unfold. And that's what I think the future of humanity in space is. So I think, you know, a lot of people are frustrated at how long this thing is taking, but that's how exponential growth works. In the very beginning, you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't tell that it's actually happening. But then over time, things start to dramatically pick up and you're like, wait a minute, okay, I'm starting to see stuff now. And then a day later, everything is fully deployed and optimized. And that's what we're on. We're on an exponential growth. And it takes a certain kind of, um, not, not imagination, but a certain kind of thinking that that it's very difficult for the human mind to wrap itself around this idea of exponential growth. So in the short term, I think we're going to see most people follow our increasing gross domestic product increase, 
we're going to be seeing technology continue to develop, we're going to see more and more infrastructure, you're going to see telecommunications out in space, you're going to see uh, people testing out technologies for mining resources locally to support their local satellites and and bases. And then eventually, not shortly, you will see permanent habitations on other places across the solar system. And uh, it'll all just keep going from there. Now, obviously, you know, people are going to be like, yeah, but things could change, right? Things could not keep going and growing in the way they have for the history of humanity. And like, obviously, right? Obviously, we could be on an S curve, and we're going to reach a limit of growth, or we're going to set ourselves back through bad policy, through nuclear war, through climate change, like we, we could easily do something that is going to take this and set it into a completely different trajectory. Uh, but human beings are innovative, human beings are amazingly capable of doing things uh, when they set their minds to it. And I have a lot of trust that we're going to pull this off. So I think the future looks great, except for the robot uprising. I haven't figured out how to fold that in. It's time to shout out all our new $5 patrons and above. Drudy, Jason Woods, Jim Grove, Jonathan Amundsen, D.E. Godier, Apo Symbiosis, Lejuan E., Dennis Martin, CPA Design, and Christian Rekadel. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Sal, is mining minerals the primary objective of colonizing Mars? I don't know what the primary objective of colonizing Mars is. No one has described a good, what I consider to be a good objective for colonizing Mars. The main reason that people talk about is that you want to have humanity living on two worlds, that you want to get our, our eggs out of this, this one basket. And you know, that sounds reasonable, but the best possible Mars is still so much more horrible than the worst possible Earth that you could go to Antarctica uh, in the wintertime, and it is still vastly more hospitable than Mars is, and that we could have terrible global warming, we could have nuclear war, we could have an asteroid crash into Earth, we could pollute our skies, we could do just the worst possible things to our planet, or the universe could do terrible things to our planet, it would still be, you know, if you're looking at two worlds and go, should we colonize Earth? Or should we colonize Mars, you would want to colonize Earth, because it is the much, much better planet. People talk about that we can mine resources on Mars. Well, Mars has kind of the same stuff that Earth has, but less. And it is really hard to get to and ludicrously expensive. The explanation that I always give is that if there were bars of gold sitting on the moon, if there were bars of gold sitting on asteroids, and bars of gold sitting on Mars, that it would be too expensive to go and pick them up that it would cost you billions of dollars to bring back millions of dollars worth of, of minerals like that math just doesn't hold. And so, uh, you know, apart from it would be a fun adventure. Uh, there's no good long term reason for us to go and colonize Mars in the same way that except, you know, there's some scientific reasons we'd want to go to Mars in the way, you know, and you can just use the exact same analogies when you think about going to Antarctica, you just say, what is the point of going and living in Antarctica, like at least they have penguins to hang out with, right? Uh, at least you can breathe the air, you can drink the water that you melt, you're protected from the radiation and you're under Earth's gravity, uh, all these things you have in your favor. And yeah, the the temperatures get cold, but not as cold as it gets on Mars, you know. Uh, so, so right now, nobody has offered up a good reason to colonize Mars. And so until that happens, any attempt to colonize Mars will fail, because that you'll have this initial enthusiasm, people spend some money, but they won't want to continue spending the money, they'll go out of business, they'll go bankrupt because there's no money to be made. And so until that overall infrastructure builds up to the point that Mars is a place that makes sense to colonize, we won't colonize it. Aaron Dwyer, is there a direction we can point to in the sky and say the Big Bang happened over that way? Uh, Big Bang happened everywhere. And so you can point to any direction in the sky, and you can say the Big Bang happened over that way, and you would be right. And the reason is because the Big Bang is not an explosion in space, it is an expansion of space. And so every part of the universe is getting farther away from every other part of the universe. Now, obviously, galaxies can hold themselves together, the planet holds itself together because of gravity. So you know, locally, things can resist the expansion of the universe. And so a good way to think about it, as always is, you know, don't think it about it as this sort of 
circle that's getting the sphere that's getting bigger. Think of it as an infinite volume where everything is getting farther apart, a decrease of density in the universe. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? And we call that Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, what sparked my interest for space as a kid? And I'll put a link in the show notes. You can go watch that right now. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who joined us for the live show, everybody who asked your questions in the YouTube comments. Now, uh, we've got our upcoming schedule of live streams coming back. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caradwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nelson, David Gilson, David Matz, Evan Pro, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Mazzo, Nick Borquez, Nick Solari, Paul Robach, Rink Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Mully, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So we've got. First up, which I'm going to talk about in this episode, uh, Astronomy Cast, which is, of course, the long running show that I've been doing with Dr. Pamela Gay. And I literally don't remember how many seasons we've done now. 18? 19? 700 plus episodes. Uh, and we record the show live every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Daylight Time, uh, to 12, and we do it live. And then after we finish recording, we stick around and we answer your questions about space and astronomy. Now, there's a totally separate YouTube channel for Astronomy Cast, and by the time you're watching this, I hope there will be an event there that will show you where that episode is going to be. And then you can go and watch that. But if you didn't even realize that I do this podcast astronomy cast, you might really enjoy it. We've won plenty of awards. Uh, it's much beloved. Uh, and so if you just do a search for astronomy cast on whatever podcasting software you use, you can start to get up to speed. Although I don't think you can get through all 740 episodes in time for our new season to begin. But check out astronomy cast. Hopefully we'll see you there for the live show. And uh, on the next question show, I'll talk about the return of the rest of our uh, live stream. All right, we'll see you next time.